right. Hello, friends. I'm uh, back again with my good friend James Corbett of the Corbett Report dot com. And we're uh, we've been moving through. We're taking one song from every Beatles record through chronology. And today we're on Revolver. And how hard was it to pick a song from that masterpiece? Right? I would have gone with pretty much any song on the album, but mm -hmm. we went with this one, um, which full confession right up front. And for people mm -hmm. who might be might not be a fan of this song in particular, I have been a fan of Revolver for twenty plus years now, twenty five years. Uh, it's it was my favorite Beatles album for a very long time. I think mm -hmm. it's been eclipsed by Abbey Road and Sgt. Pepper's up there. I don't know. Once you get to a certain level of genius, you know why bother choosing favorites? But um, in all that time, this was the track that I would always skip because <laughs> oh, when really? it comes to that intro. And it, uh, to lead a better life. And it just, it was so not cool. You know what I mean? Did we even say what song we're going to no, do? We did not, but people will know from the <laughs> title of this video that it is here, there, and everywhere. And so, I must admit, I for years avoided this song, but to my detriment, because it is a great song, I just had to get over the uh, kind of twee schmaltziness. <laughs> it, it, it... Yeah, twee is the perfect word. Yeah, twee is the perfect word for this. Um, so, uh, did you, uh, did you, uh, are you uh, going to read something from yes. the okay. Bible? Or? Yeah, well, first of all, first of all, let's just put on the record from last month's video, um, where you will remember we were talking about Michelle. Uh, right. First of all, uh, you might have noticed there was a, an interesting cut there where we go to the cover version of the song, and that is because you had to cut that out because the gods of YouTube would not allow you to even play a cover of that song. Interestingly, yeah. uh, no surprise, unfortunately. We'll see if t this week's cover or this month's cover gets through, but if not, there might be an interesting cut in this video, and if so, you'll know why. Um, secondarily... Uh, Full hat tip to Roy.m, who in the Corbett Report comment section when I posted this in my newsletter last month, he said, Hey James, being a Beatles fan, I watched the Just For Fun video you did with Vincognito on Michel. Great stuff! At around 10.13, a board describing various F chords was displayed containing two errors slash typos. The F7 chord is F, A, C, E flat, not B flat. And the F7 sharp 9 chord is F, A, C, E flat, not B flat, A flat. And to be extremely nerdy, the A flat should be G sharp, since the ninth above F is G, hence sharp nine. <laughs> Those minor observations aside, it was a thoroughly engaging discussion, and I enjoyed it immensely. Vinny, defend yourself. There's nothing to defend, Roy M. Uh, <laughs> Om Shanti, you are totally right. Um, and I love what you said. I absolutely love it because... I'm that kind of a stickler, especially what you said about the sharp nine chord. You're a hundred percent right. Absolutely. It should be called a G sharp because the ninth would be a G. And even though it's, it's the third, the minor third in the chord, you can't call it a, you know, dominant seventh major minor. It's ridiculous. Right on, man. And thank you for catching that. Uh, the B, uh, I guess if I were to defend myself, James knows me by now. I'm a musician. By nature, I'm lazy, so what I do is I dash off my whiteboards real quick before the show and don't check myself. So, um, great catch. Uh, great, great catch, Roy, and I do appreciate it. Okay, all right. Well, let's get into this discussion. We are talking about Here, There, and Everywhere from the Revolver album. This is a Paul song, and it's been described as an 80-20 Paul John song. Paul basically wrote it, but John added a little bit to the outro, perhaps? Question mark? There's a lot of Intro. question marks surrounding... Um, Intro. Well, I, I read the outro. Oh, okay. Wow. That's There's weird. a lot okay. of question marks surrounding the song, one of which mm -hmm. is uh, Paul has a very clear and vivid memory that he's talked about in interviews of writing this at John's poolside in on a beautiful June sunny day. He got there early. John wasn't up yet, so he just went to the pool with his guitar and plucked out some chords. And um, that would seem to indicate that this was written in June 66, just shortly, just a week or two before they went into the studio in mid-June for this song in particular, which seems to line up and make sense. It was fresh. He wanted to get it out. But he also has spoken in an interview about 
um, during the recording of Help, while they were doing the skiing scenes in Austria, he said they were putting some of their latest demos or songs on and they were listening to them on a cassette or whatever they had at the time. And John said, you know, I like that one better than any of my songs. And he was talking about Here, There, and Everywhere, but that would have placed it in 65? June yeah. 65? Or, but no, but they were recording that in March. Uh, they were recording that scene in March 65, so it would have been June 64. Anyway, whatever. Some memory here is wonky. It was probably written in, in June 66. At any rate, it was recorded in June 66. Paul recorded the... Uh, it played the guitar and recorded a, a guide vocal, but then they overdubbed it with his lead vocal later. And, uh, of course, jo uh, John and George are doing the harmonies. And Ringo's on drums, obviously. Um, not much more to talk about with regards to the production that I saw that, have, that yeah. was of interest. But at any rate, that sort of sets the table for it. But more generally, let's place this in the context of 66. What was happening in the world and how was the how were the Beatles responding to it? Uh, before that, I just want to respond to um, Paul's uh, memory lapse. You know, in order to explain this, you have to understand that since he was replaced by Fall... He forgets his lines. He forgets what he's supposed to say sometimes. So. <laughs> Ooh. James, I just lost sound. Sorry, I was muting myself. Okay, <laughs> like an expert go. pro podcast. I was just saying, <laughs> this is the last Paul album, right? Before he died, right? Right, right, right. right. So, but let's talk about this. The, co the context of the times, I, I'm not really, I, one thing I, I, I spoke with James about before we did this, we spoke together about it, is that I, one thing that's really important when you take uh, certain Beatles albums, that you, that you place them in the historical context, because they always had this reflective quality on society, and basically we're saying, okay, here's the new change that's going to happen. Here's a new thing that we're moving into. So by 66, this time, now the hippies, like in terms of popular culture, they've made it into the news. People are now very much aware that there's a hippie movement. Uh, the hippies, they, they haven't gone their full explosion yet, but it's there. And in fact, I remember as a child, I, I had heard that the hippies were saying about the Beatles, well, is he one of us? Are they one of us? You know? Are they taking the psychedelics and are they, you know, uh, counterculture, anti-establishment, you know? Because there were always little hints in the Beatles music, but never anything quite outright. You, you know? would think Tomorrow Never Knows would be a pretty big hint. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think they might be. <laughs> now, um, speaking of the Paul is Dead thing, you know, what, what I find interesting, uh, he was asked about... Uh, uh, somebody, one interviewer once asked him if he had a particular song that he felt was a turning point in his songwriting career. And that song was Eleanor Rigby, also on Revolver. Now, when I take the Paul songs, for no one, uh, here, there, and everywhere, got to get you into my life. And um, this is one I just mentioned. <laughs> there we Eleanor go. Eleanor Rigby? Uh, Eleanor Rigby. I would put Eleanor Rigby and for no one in one compartment and I'd put got to get you into my life and uh, here, there and everywhere in another. The, the, there's a weird thing that goes on sometimes. Like sometimes I feel like some of the songs that crop up on an album feel like they should be on a different album and here, there and everywhere and got to get you into my life do not feel psychedelic. They don't feel well, they do feel like something new is happening. Uh, at least got to get you into my life because they were, you know, experimenting with horns and that and all that. But um, it doesn't have quite the psychedelic effect that for no one, in a sense, for no one is psychedelic because he's, it's almost like an existential look at something from a distance, you know. And uh, Eleanor Rigby, to me, is highly psychedelic. You know, it's... Um, I, you know, the big thing that was happening in those days was this line was drawn between the freaks and the straights. And the straights were everyday middle class people that just kind of went along to get along. And the hippies were kind of against that and trying to do something new. Uh, so Eleanor Rigby, to me, is a turning point, no doubt, in Paul's writing. 
But I, I get that dichotomy. Sometimes I think like it's almost as if, you know, strangely enough, here, there and everywhere could go on Abbey Road. It would fit very well on Abbey Road. Um, so, yeah, there's a, I, the, what I feel about Revolver, I love it's my favorite Beatles record, like like you uh, felt for a while. Um, but there there appears to be like it's pre tripping Paul or something like that. Like he isn't quite into the uh, psychedelic thing yet, you know. All right. So, uh, I don't know, little bits of trivia. Let me see if there's anything else I have here that you haven't mentioned. Um, well, one thing I want to say right off the bat, we're not going to talk much about lyrics because. Well, we, I am actually. Few things. I have a couple of things to note about it. Yeah, there are. There's some cool things going on with the lyrics, but I want to mention uh, the uh, another Beatles, what I call a Beatles first and last. And what I mean by a first and last is the first time they've done this particular thing. And it's also the last time they've ever done it because they were so restless and kept moving on. And in this song, um, I've never seen this before in any other song, Beatles or not. The title of the song is scattered around the entire piece of music, right? First verse is here, second verse is there, the bridge is everywhere, and then he manages to come back to the here and the there or something like that. But interestingly, so how can you call anything a chorus in this, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, no it's generally... Right? Um, the structure that they, they, I've always seen it written as is verse, verse, bridge, verse, bridge, verse, bridge, or whatever. Right, whatever right. Outro. So as re regards the structure, let's, let's look at that for a sec. All right, so here is the form for the song. We have our lovely intro. Uh, the A section would be a verse. So we have two verses, then we come to the modulated bridge. We go to the verse, do the bridge, and one more verse. And then in the coda, the outro, as they call them, uh, what's really interesting is this is finally where he says here, there, and everywhere all in the same statement. And he says it twice. And my take on that is um, it, he, would, he did it for pop reasons, pop music reasons. In other words, uh, you know, back back in the day, you know, well, guys, you know, you got to have something that catches the person's mind. The title of the song is really, really important, right? So it, it might have been just pop awareness, like, let's, let's get this down so that, you know, the song is ending with the title, here, there, and everywhere. That's my take on that. Yeah, sounds about so, right. And, and I think you're right, it kind of builds up to that, because as you say, it's scattered throughout. And that's the thing that I never consciously noticed in 20 years of avoiding listening to this song. Uh, but <laughs> okay, now that okay. I, I sat down with it and I, I saw, oh, John, uh, Paul was really happy with that, the way the first verse starts with here, the second verse starts with there. The third verse actually starts with everywhere, as well as the, the bridge, but the verse starts everywhere, knowing that love is to share. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, right, right, right. No, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, Cause, but but to love her is to need her everywhere. Every yeah, yeah wow, wow. <laughs> now this song to me is kind of in the truth. I think Paul, and you'll see why for a reason. I think at this moment Paul knew he was writing a love song. Which, by the way, if you're a songwriter, go ahead and try to write a serious, not cynical, a serious love song. It is the hardest challenge you could imagine. Not a heartbreak song, but an I love this woman song. Really hard. And the Beatles were masterful at this. Um, now, I think Paul was thinking, like, when he started doing this, I think he thought to himself, oh, it looks like I've got another sweet little love song here. Let's see, what was the last big love song hit I wrote? Yesterday. Maybe. It, and all of a sudden, a, a, a shift happens in the chord progression that is an exact replication of what happens in yesterday. So I have a theory that he was thinking of yesterday. So why don't we play a bit of the song? Uh, Rafa Dominish does a nice little uh, detailed uh, version of it, cover version of it. And uh, we'll just give it a little bit of listen. To lead a better life. So what 
we have, and later on I'll be sharing the, the actual full chord progression of the song. For the intro, to lead a better life, I need my love to be here. So we got a G, a B minor, B flat, beautiful, D, D7, sus4, D7. Okay. All right, so uh, there's no big surprise here in terms of the first two chords because we're in the key of G. We have the one chord, the first chord of the key of G, the B minor chord. Now, you know, by the way, anybody that's into the theory, if you want to go to the Wikipedia page about this, they really do a kind of Vinny-esque breakdown. It's very well done. It's the way I would have done it. Um, in any case, uh, where is this B flat coming from, right? And then D7 sus4. D7. I, I have a theory. And what is that? G major. The parallel key is G minor. The relative major of G minor is B flat major. Yes. Interestingly, what I like about this, very well done. Uh, uh, what that's I like not, about this. <laughs> that's Alan Parsons, but, or Alan Pollock, sorry. But, yeah. That wasn't your analysis, James? Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, no. But the, when, the, when I read it, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> this is all about the parallel relative switch. It's all about it. Um, now we, you know, we have a pretty, I wouldn't say basic, but a really not shocking chord progression for the verses. It's very mellifluous, but we make the sudden, when we go to the bridge, we make the sudden move to the key of B flat major. So what I like to think about this B flat when it shows up, it's kind of like a foretelling of what's to come that that B flat will show up folks. Right. That's right. That's also what Alan Pollock noted. So there you go. Well, I got to talk to that guy. I think we're on the same page. Now, uh, the key of G, the chords for the key of G are G, A minor, B minor, C, D, and E minor. And what this song does is it walks up the, the scale steps. Do, Re, Mi, Fa. Only other song I can think of that does that is uh, Once upon a time you dressed so fine Didn't have a dime in your front so uh, another great song. Um, so we're walking up the key of G, G, A minor, B minor, C. That happens twice, right? But then we get this change up. Now we're on a C chord, and then we're going to go to F sharp minor, B7. Whoa! But then we're eased back in, going back into the regular. F sharp, F -sharp minor, minor or F sharp minor 7? You know what? I don't know. I, it could be F sharp minor straight. But when I saw one of the guys, um, I think it was Josh, Josh Turner, the, uh, the guy you sent me, he was doing like major sevens. And it's kind of implied if you're going to put a major seven in a song, you'll probably put a minor seven as well. I don't know. I, I don't hear major sevens in the song, really. Um, no, I think he was jazzing it up. Right. All right. So... Now we get nerdy, okay? What this is, F sharp minor, B7, E minor. All right, before I go to the F sharp minor, what do you think the B7 is? Well, the B7 clearly leads to the E major, minor? Does it, can it go to either, I guess? Well, if you wanted to be daring, you could do a, like a really extreme modulation of the key of E major. Right. Yeah. Uh, or well, well, it wouldn't even be that though. If it was E seven, see B seven is a secondary dominant. Okay, that's where right. it is. Right. B seven leads to E. Right. Five seven of six is yeah. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But if we look at the so-called minor keys, the two five in E harmonic minor would be this. But we have the softer. Mm. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. What, what, what did you play originally there? What was that? That was F sharp minor seven flat five. I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you a screen share of, of, of the two key, the two kinds of key, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I, I really am loath to call them keys, but because of my music theory, but we'll call them that. Uh, the key of E harmonic minor, the two chord of the key. <laughs> Is F sharp minor seven flat five to, mm -hmm. and the five chord is B seven in both. Mm -hmm. okay. In melodic minor, instead of F sharp minor seven flat five, we have the much more 
it's smoother and softer. Mm. Yeah. And I just want to make a remark here. There's a, a few little, very small, little, tiny references to melodic minor. If you were to like take John and Paul's personalities, John is harmonic minor. Paul is is melodic minor. Because that's John, all right? If there's any, if there, uh, anybody to my story, right? right. right. Um, and also, life is very short, but there's no time. That's harmonic minor. That was John's, okay? But I mean, even personality-wise, like John was a little more edgy and spicy, and that, that melodic minor, that harmonic minor has that bit of edge. But what happens with the scale when you change it to melodic minor is you raising the sixth step as well as the seventh step. And I'll show you guys in a minute. And what it does is it softens. So let me show you the, the difference between the two scales. That's harmonic, harmonic minor. Right. Yeah. This is melodic. And in because fact, the harmonic just, minor has a one and a half step? Yes. Level? Right. And what, what happens when you make melodic minor, it goes back to only half steps and whole steps. There is no jump like right. that. Yep, okay. yep, 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 yep. So let me just screen share the, um, yeah, this is, this is it. So, all right. So what we have here on top, we have the key, the notes of E harmonic minor. Uh, Right below, we have the actual chords you build from that key. And I've made in red, there's my F sharp minor 7 flat 5, right? And here are the notes of E melodic minor. And you notice that C that was up here now becomes a C sharp. Well, when I build the F sharp chord now, I get F sharp A C, C sharp, not F sharp A C, all right? I hope I Roy forgot. M is going to fact check this. Yeah, no, that's right. The only thing I didn't put was a bracket to the E because I want an F sharp minor seven, but I put F sharp minor, whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's just a little point, you know. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. And you notice, I mean, just as a side note, you get a lot of hairball triads in, in these uh, tweaked keys, right. like G augmented, mm, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah, yeah. the D sharp diminished. Here, so what you're Milan, saying is this F sharp to... Um, to B7 to E minor is the 2 5 1 in E minor. It's a melodic minor, minor 2 right. 5. Yeah. Okay. It's a melodic minor 2 5. So that's how that's working. Right. I just wanted to give you guys that. Um, and then again, like, you know, the only weird out. Oh, there's one thing I want to show you here the very obtuse movement in the bass when that happens. He goes from a C chord root, C root, to an F sharp root. That's a tritone distance, mm. right? Yeah. Normally, it's, it's hairy. Mm. Normally, it's a pretty hairy distance to hear, but in this particular case, I mean, if you isolate the two and just go, it sounds weird, mm. right? But it doesn't sound pretty like a ballad. Yeah. Right. By the way, if you want to hear Paul going melodic minor crazy, it's just so beautiful. Um, it's kind of a dorky song, and John hated it uh, from his solo career. It's called Another Day. It's really kind of twee, too. But uh, but still, I mean, he has this middle section that goes into melodic minor. It's so beautiful. It's like, what a great writer he was. What a great writer. Okay, so any case, we... To E minor, and now we're back into the template of the key of G. You know, F sharp minor and B7 are not in the key of G. B7 functions as a secondary dominant, but it brings us to E minor, the relative minor. Then we go to A minor. Now, here's a really cool thing he do does we go from D7 to B flat major. There's the parallel relative switch right there. We are modulated and dedicated to to, uh, to B flat major. But you know, one thing I like about this, it believe it strangely enough, this kind of thing happens with Miles Davis's uh, "So What," 
you know that thing? Um, I forget. Um, but the song, he, there's a kind of, a, that song is kind of a test for musicians because you really have to hear it modulates up a half set. It goes A, A, B, A, but the A's are really long and the B is really long and you, you modulate up a half step. So when you're playing the whole round, mm. it's so long that you have to keep track of, mm. wait, which amp? Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know? But what a lot of uh, musicians do, I've heard Larry Carlton do this and many musicians, is just before, just before it, it modulates to the key of E flat minor from D minor, I think it's in D minor, modulates a half step up to E flat minor, right? A lot of improvisers will, they're still on, say, the last two bars of the D minor, they'll start playing E flat minor against that. So when it comes in, you're setting up this tension and it's kind of, oh, okay, that's what's going on, right? Well, Paul does this. He, he's introducing the key of B flat before he comes in. How does he do it? He does it melodically. Then my B flat. So his melody is no longer following mm. the, the B Should we listen to the cover version? Should we? Yeah, oh, let's go there. Yeah, yeah. let's go there. Right. But she doesn't know he's there. I want her everywhere. And if she's besides me, I know I need never care. But to love her is to need her everywhere. No. All right. So, so here is from the. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me give the layman perspective on that. Um, hearing you. The the end of the bridge flows into the beginning of the verse so that I don't think the musical layman would understand where that actually divides. Yeah, well, here's the beauty of it. I mean, this is... Uh, it's, Paul is such a great writer. It's just unbelievable. Um, all right, well, first, he teases us. He's well, not teasing us, but he's giving us, again, foretaste of the key of B-flat. We're on D7. We're expecting G. Goes and that one now, all the notes are from G except for that one little B flat, and that B flat comes from the key of G, comes from G minor, which is the relative minor of B flat major, or you can just think of it as the root of B flat major. But right, so we're getting that hint. Just from that one little note, he leads us in so subtle, so perfect, so beautiful. Go fall. All right. <laughs> no, you see, this was Paul, right? When did he die? I can't remember. I can't keep it straight. Well, it was around, it was supposedly November of 66. Well, there you go. So this was Paul. There you go. This, this was actually Paul, which makes no sense because if this is really Paul, if Paul, had, uh, you know, wait, what am I trying to say here? Eleanor Rigby is is Paul experimenting with a new sound, you know, so you would think that fall would have done that, you know, he would have been the guy to bring in the mm, new sound. Right, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Right? Like, it would make more yeah. sense if you said Paul died in early 66 and then started writing this stuff. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, exactly. people, for people who don't know, we have done an entire conversation about the Beatles conspiracy and we talked about Paul is dead extensively. So we'll direct people to that if they want more. Yes, it's on my channel. You can search it out. Uh, everything I uh, learned about... Know about cons conspiracies I learned from the Beatles. Yeah. Yes, okay. Now, let me share the screen here and give you the chord progression. So, uh, well, a little... No, that's good. It's all there. So, there's our intro. G, B minor, B flat. Which, by the way, is in rubato time, meaning there's no time yet. And then I think Ringo brings in a drum roll bump. But uh, but and then we come in two time. So there is our verse with the G A minor B minor C G A minor B minor C F sharp minor B seven twice E minor A minor D seven sus four D seven. Now this bridge is just magnificent. B flat. Now you think he's going to do the sixty uh, the uh, fifty style doo wop progression. Sure enough, the first three chords are exactly that. But he 
brings us into harmonic minor there, G harmonic minor, the relative minor of the key of B flat. And note, notable is, is uh, by the way, when you look at uh, uh, who played what on this, Paul played rhythm guitar. It wasn't George. Uh, John only did vocals. And they did finger snaps all together, which is kind of, I don't know why they thought of the finger snaps. That's kind of silly. But um, George's contribution, he's, he's cited as the lead guitarist on this. And that's when he goes... Beautiful. That's a beautiful line. Um, all right, we'll get to that, though. Um, so, yeah, we get this harmonic minor situation. When we come to this D7 resolving to G minor... And then we continue to that C minor and back to our D7, which is also the 5-7 of the key of G major, not just G harmonic minor. And then the sun begins to shine because we're now in major territory and not minor territory. All right. Yeah, I would give credit if I could remember where I read it, but someone was saying it's like when... Uh... You, when the storm clouds roll in in the afternoon and you figure, oh, it's going to rain, but then suddenly the sun comes out anyway. Exactly. That's, that's what it is. It's the old Picardy third. The parallel relative switch is an elaborate, an elaborate version of the Picardy third. It's going mm. from minor to major. Okay. Right. That's, you know. All right. So, um, yeah. So let me just put alan pollock's analysis on the record because he says the home key of the song is g major but both its relative minor e as well as the parallel minor and its relative major g and b flat make important appearances both paul and john were fond of these types of key schemes and there are many songs we've looked at that use one or more of these tricks this is a particularly rare example in which all of them are used in the same song in the same song we get g major e relative minor B flat major, G relative minor. Just wow. Just wow. And again, there's another first and last. What other Beatles song used, you know, every possibility of those at once? You know, maybe there is one. I don't, I don't know. But still, wow. Wow. Dang. So, like, how do we get back so nicely? Because that D7, which we've been hearing resolved to G minor over and over again. Well, not over and over again, but, you know, enough to solidly root us in minor when the all of a sudden ah okay we're back to a verse now um and you know i, I don't know if it was intentionally done but everywhere that it, it goes into that when he sings everywhere yeah. Yeah. right the melody so on going, that really grounds you back in the major and well i'm, I'm talking about coming into it into um, the bridge mm-hmm. i want her everywhere oh, right 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 right, right? right, right. Well, he's going somewhere. He's going to be flat. So it works lyrically against the chord movement. He's, he's gone somewhere else and she's still there. Or he wants her to be there. What about, uh, so changing my life with a wave of her hand. And that's when he goes into the F sharp uh, right. to F sharp minor to B7, which is the part start yeah. of the modulation, right? Yeah. So he changing yeah. the song, changing the, changing his life. Yeah, actually, that I, I didn't even stop to think, but that's a beautiful line, changing mm. my life with a wave of her hand. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah, great, great. Now, let's talk about that little line. Okay, this is something I always pound into my students. I, I tell them over and over again. When you think minor key... Think the natural minor, which would be Aeolian or, you know, however you want to think of it, relative minor. All three are the same name, uh, different names for the same thing. You think of the natural minor, which has no raised seventh. You think of harmonic minor and you think of melodic minor and you lump all of them together because that's the way it works. Mm. This is how we could get a chromatic line like this. Mm, Right. Yeah. Right. And we'll go to the rest of it in a second. But where do we get all this chromaticism? Well, this D note is common to all types of G minor uh, scales. This is in the harmonic minor and the natural minor. This is in the melodic minor only. This is in the natural minor. If he wanted to go really crazy, he might have gone. You know, yeah. Uh, 
because you can literally do that. Now there I went full chromatic to the fifth step and then I did the blue note, which gave me another chromatic note, and then I did the, uh, the fourth step. So that's why jazz players love minor keys because you, you can, can hit anything. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot there you could get away with, absolutely. And I've done some weird stuff in minor keys, you I, know. I should add this from Beatlesbooks.com where, where they're describing this. As his line, I need never care, is being completed, George begins his double-tracked rising and falling lead guitar passage, which appears rushed in the third measure. It then stabilizes for the fourth measure as it is reduced to a single track performance, this finishing up the bridge. The third verse then com commences with the same instrumentation as the previous two, including the reemergence of the lush harmonies. In the repeat of the bridge that comes immediately afterward, Paul makes sure his guitar doesn't squeak this time around. George also makes sure his guitar passage in the last two measures isn't rushed. I guess practice makes perfect. <laughs> oh, wow. I got <laughs> That's always true with George, though. I mean, at least, you know. For a while, um, yeah. Well, as as we've said, they were doing so much of this on the fly that they were literally learning their parts as they were recording. So, yeah, amazing. sometimes you can kind of hear that. Uh, all right. All right. So now the next line, this. And just scale steps that work against. Now, what that's doing is playing around the mode that's involved on C minor. It's still the key of G minor, but, but you know, he's the third and the fifth of the C minor chord. And then to the C minor of the, the C note of the C minor. Uh, I'm sorry. We by that point we're on D7, and then we get to the G major. So here you can hear harmonic minor. So, uh, yeah, that's just playing around the scale, you know, the key he's in at that point. Um, but, again, it's very classy, very nicely done. Um, beautiful work. I, George may have I, – I wouldn't be surprised if George came up with that idea himself and it wasn't Paul's. Um, yeah, what I had heard – so that's, that's pretty much – that's pretty much the wrap-up of – and we got to get going soon anyway – uh, here's a little bit of trivia, though. I, I don't know if you heard about this. You know this, the uh, po John's posthumous song, uh, Real Love, that the Beatles came in and... Um, supposedly the harmonies from one of the takes of this song were flown into Real Love, but it's not on any Beatles recording. Like, you, you can't find the recording anywhere yet. It'll probably be dug up one day, but that's I read this, I think, on Wikipedia. So that's a cute, uh, that's a curious little thing right there. Now, as as regards, I had read that that John helped Paul with the intro, and I I got the sense it was really about the uh, lyric more than anything else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I read. It was about the lyric as well. Yeah. yeah. And oh, uh, it, Mal it, Evans apparently, the road manager. Uh, claims a piece of the songwriting pie. At the time, road manager Neil Aspinall and I were staying in a hotel in London, and we'd been up rather late until about 7 o'clock in the morning, and we were really whacked out. And at 9 o'clock, there's a bang at the door, and jolly old Paul comes in with a smile from ear to ear. Good morning, lads. Thought we'd come and have breakfast with you. Oh, sure, Paul, we replied. Then he said, I've got this song of mine, and I'm stuck for a line. So he sits down, plays it for us, and sings it. And the line I came up with was, Watching her eyes, hoping I'm always there. I'm very eye conscious. That's true. He is. I'm looking through you. Uh, actually, uh, you know, rubber soul. There was a lot of. Well, I think eye that's soul. Mal saying that. Oh, I'm Mal very, is saying that. I'm very eye conscious. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, yeah. Okay, I get it. I get it. Okay, yeah. Well, Paul must have liked that anyway, though. He yeah. was. Paul was very visual, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of that. Even George got into this visual thing. I think it was a psychedelics or something with him mm. because 
Yeah, that line, although your mind's opaque, you know. Try thinking uh, more if just for your own sake. Just for your own sake. Yeah, uh, yeah whatever. Uh, anyway, well, James, it looks like I know you, you're on a schedule, so we've got to wrap it up. And I, oh, uh, the coda, that's the last thing. Right, yeah. And all it is is basically an iteration of a verse. Uh, to be there. Plagal so, cadence. Very good, yeah. Four to one. Plagal cadence. I, I read it, but yeah, it does. Yeah, I know. I know that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, George, uh, you know, Paul talked about the plagal cadence. He actually liked that cadence a lot, and it comes out of gospel, strongly yeah. gospel. Uh, the outro. The outro finishes off the song harmonically on a plagal cadence one four one. Don't estimate the extent to which the absence of the five chord at this juncture allows the music to end on a more laid back note than it would with the five chord. Try the alternative out in your head if you don't believe me. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, it's a much stronger resolution, but it's yeah. it's harsh yeah. compared to the four. Yep. All right, uh, let's do a quick look at my notes here to see if there's anything else. Uh, Pet sounds influence. Hmm. Mm. Apparently, yeah. Yeah, because apparently he had heard an early uh, version of Pet sounds. And you know what? That's what it was with the intro. Pardon me, I was wrong. It wasn't John about the intro. Mm. Paul said this. Mm. it was influenced by Brian Wilson's Pet Sounds, but he said only the intro part. Hmm. And, and he was going for, like, the old 40s-style tunes yeah. where they have, like, right. like for musical plays, they yeah. introduce a song, they have this, oh, yeah. he's coming through my door now, yeah. and then the song kicks in, you know. Uh, so he was playing on that little thing. Uh, if you listen closely to the harmonies, which we haven't discussed, they're called block harmonies. And basically, they're just an outline of the triads. So they're literally singing in the background harmonies. But when you do isolate them, there is an isolated version. Um, you can hear that Beach Boysy kind of velvety, we want to make this really clean and pure sounding harmony. And mm. they did it, mm. of course. Yeah. Beautiful song, and uh, I think worthy to note that given the way the entire song flows, there is no instrumental break, there's no solo or anything, but it doesn't need it. It just flows completely yeah. start to finish. Yeah. In the classic tradition of a great McCartney ballad, definitely one of the greats of Paul's ballads. Yeah. I must admit the thing that got me to start listening to it was when I read, oh, John said this was his favorite Paul song. Well, there must be something good to it. <laughs> You know, that, you know, that's always interesting. It interested me. It was like John did say that to him. And it's, it's like, okay, what about this mm. appeals to John? Yeah. You know, because it's this such does a not, not seem, John yeah, song. like a not John song. But maybe that's the thing. Like, I could never write that. Or maybe that's the it could be that thing. Oh, when we were talking uh, last week about Beatles, you, uh, you mentioned, I love that you said this, uh, referring to Mozart. Remember you said that, uh, well, Paul, Paul is like Mozart. Oh, there's my New York Paul. Uh, Paul is like Mozart, and and John is Salieri to Paul's Mozart. No, right. <laughs> right. no I, I wasn't saying John. I Yeah, I can't remember who I was saying that about, but uh, yeah. But like, I can imagine a lot of people would get very angry at Paul, but <laughs> he's probably... Actually, yeah. from my mind, <laughs> the, the moment that I think of with regard to that is Taxman, because... As I've read, and I don't know if this is true, but apparently George was kind of hung up, like, what to do with the solo. And so Paul was like, oh, why don't you try this? And he picks it up and he comes out with that solo just off the top of his head. <laughs> and I can imagine being so angry, but you got to use it because it's the best song the Beatles, uh, the best solo the Beatles ever did. <laughs> right. It's, it's an amazing brilliant. solo. I, th I once saw a little, there's this little, some guy who produces his little Beatles cartoon, and I, I don't know if you might have seen that one, but there's George working on, it might have been yeah. Taxman, yeah. and Paul yeah, keeps yeah. walking in and out, and he's With playing like tuba like, and whatever, and he's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's adding those up. Yeah. And then he does a solo, George. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, if it, Paul was in any, anybody's band, everybody would hate him. 
Definitely. But <laughs> you got to love them. You uh, got to love them. Anyway. All right. Speaking of which, I'll put in a plug again. I think I mentioned it last time, but I've finished watching that Lennon and McCartney documentary series, and I think it is worth watching for people who are interested in this stuff, because uh, even if you are a dedicated, hardcore Beatles fan, there will be stuff in there you have not heard or seen before. Absolutely, yeah. I've ch I took James's advice. I took your advice and looked at it, and uh, um, yeah, there's interviews there I never saw before. It was really exciting. I love to catch all the mm. alternate... That's one thing great about the Beatles. There was no shortage of media on the Beatles, yeah. you know. And it really tells the story in a different way that gives you a different appreciation. Um, mm -hmm. And I won't spoil it for anyone, but I think it ends quite nicely. I think, yeah. I think people should stick with it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so next, Sergeant Pepper. Oh, wow, Sergeant yeah. Pepper. We are moving I along I have a feeling here. I... Mm. I have a feeling I know what you're going to suggest. I, but I, I, I have a we'll feeling see. you don't, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Because I had right. an idea. I'm like, I don't think John, uh, Vinny would even want it. I almost called you John. That's weird. I don't think Vinny would want to do that. Well, we'll see. We'll talk about it. Okay. All right. Cool. That'll be exciting. Peppers. My God. It will. Groundbreaking album. Yeah. Not my favorite record. I, I still love... Uh, revolver over peppers yeah. it wasn't even in my top five until i heard the 2017 mix and it's yeah. like i heard the yeah. album for the first time i'm like wow this is an amazing album so anyway, yeah who knows one critic claimed it was it was too polished and glitzy and the songwriting wasn't as good and they're just like polishing turds and I, i'm like no this is really really creative work mm. yeah Ech. critics yeah critics all right, we'll leave it right. there. Are you going to wrap it up, say goodbye? I'm going to wrap it up and say goodbye. Please uh, visit James at James Cor at, at uh, CorbettReport.com, uh, especially in times like this. James, uh, you dig up all the important information. You do a wonderful job of research, and a lot of people out there, a lot of people got your back. They, they love what you do. I certainly do. And uh, we, we need your message in these times. We really do. We need well, to know uh, what's going on. I, this may become my only outlet on YouTube in the near future. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, right. Exactly. A lot of people yeah. are getting the X. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Mm. It's crazy. So, yeah, that's it for uh, for tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. James, thank you again once again for joining me on this. It's always a great pleasure. All right. Take care. See you guys soon. Take care.